Perfect. Well, well, welcome everyone. First and foremost, you know, we are trying something new, which is live streaming our seven investing podcast today. Uh, this is the very inaugural voyage. We've never done this before. So uh, bear with us as we figure out a new platform and how to do this live. Uh, I'm Simon Erickson. I'm joined by Nirvan Mahanti. We are both elite advisors at seven investing. If you're unfamiliar with seven investing, we provide our seven top stock market ideas each and every month, and that's at seveninvesting.com. And we also like to provide a free podcast, and like we said, we're going to do this one live here today, uh, which means if you have questions for us, those will actually be featured in the podcast as well. So there's a live chat. Uh, if you want to submit questions, go ahead and submit them on the right-hand side of the screen there. Uh, hopefully that's appearing for everybody. But um, that's my spiel. And Nirvan, how are things going in Sydney? How are you doing before we get started here? Uh, no, I've been good. You know, it's been a rainy night yesterday. Um, you know, I think we have the La Nina out here for the third year in a row, which uh, doesn't sound good because, you know, the grounds are soggy, the dams are full. And if we get a full-on onslaught of rain, that's not going to be nice. You know, we don't want a third year of you know, floods and stuff like that. But climate change, I think, is real. It seems like it. <laughs> Too many coincidences do not be real. It is impacting Australia. Goodness. So stay safe down there on your bond. Let's chat about Snap, a company previously known as Snapchat. You wrote a fantastic article that's on our seven investing site, uh, which looked into a restructuring that Snap is going through uh, right alongside its earnings there. It, kind of the higher level, what's going on with Snap these days? Yeah, so like actually there are two pieces of article. Both of them actually are freely available on the, uh, the Seven Investing website. One of them, the first one that I wrote was looking at, you know, I looked at Snap's uh, most recent earnings and so I went backwards. And one of the things that I'd like to point out, and this is really good, is the Snap I think has been like this is what it sees today and it tells you what it sees and it says it really clearly. Now, um, at a high level, what basically Snap recently announced uh, through their SEC filing is that they're going to, you know, they're going to slash staff, you know, what 10 or some percent, I forgot the exact number. They're trying to save about $500 million or so cash costs. Um, and they're really trying to turn around, I guess, the or reduce the cost base that they've got, which they had ramped up, you know, in the in sort of the COVID months because there was just a rush for advertising in that time, right? And and the cash costs are significantly higher. They've got a large base of people who are trying to sell ads, and all of these people right now don't have that many ads to sell, and there's not many, not that many leads to have, and that basically means that you know your operating expenses are significantly higher than your revenue growth, which is always a problem. But but to just to step back, right? As I said, the the first article that I wrote looked at what happened at at uh, Snap over a period of like say four or five quarters, right? And I just started looking at it pre the iOS changes, because one of the things that is pretty common in the advertising world is to say, well, you know, the app tracking, um, you know, Apple's, uh, uh, you know, tr transparency tracking came online and that basically destroyed the ad market in, in sort of the mobile world and, and things like that. W what is interesting though, is that number one, when Snap, when the change first arrived, Snap basically said, oh, you know, look, our users are actually um, opting in Right, because it's an opt-in feature. Do you want the app to track you and know, opting in at a much higher rate than uh, you know one would have expected or that uh, the industry accept, uh, expected? Right, that's a good thing for them because that allows them to track and it allows them to get a get a better footprint. So that was one of the things that they said, and that, that was the time when you know uh, brand advertising. So you know this is like Ford advertising its vehicles and you know. Key advertising his vehicles and you know uh, Kellogg's advertising. It's you know all of those stuff was was really hot. So the stuff was growing really quickly, you know, um, and that continued right until sort of the war on Ukraine happened. And that sort of is is like the turning point. The the, the war happened, and for ten days everything just froze, right? And that highlights a couple of different things, right? One highlights the, how fragile. So sort of digital advertising is right. Yeah, I mean, you can turn it on as easily as you can turn it off. <laughs> Something that's easy to turn on, it's easy to turn off. And uh, another way to think about this is if there are pressures on um, on your budget. If you're a company and there are pressures on your budget, there is supply chain issues, there is inflation, there's you know cost of labor that's going up. Uh, all of these things exist. Then, well, 
one of the easiest things you can cut is advertising. The brand advertising is easy one to cut because you know it, brand advertising does not directly result even in sales, right? In, in like it's you expect that the brand information gets there and it creates an impact and then over time it results in sales, right? But it's not an immediate. It's not like a click through the link and you make a sale. So it has a different sort of feel and it's easy to it, dial back. So they dial that back um, and people started dialing that back. And then after 10 days though, you know, when people figured out what was going on, uh, the ads came back onto the platform and they were sort of at the rate pre, uh, you know, at, their, at the pre-COVID levels, sort of, you know, they were back at that level, but they were not growing anymore as quickly, right? So I think a confluence of things happened for Snap, you know, uh, and, and the confluence of things would be supply chain issues finally catching up with the broader economy, macro issues in general, um, uh, you know, cost of oil going up or uh, gas going up and that sort of driving inflation as well. Com combine that with reopening of the economy, right? I mean, people are spending elsewhere. They're no longer sitting on their devices and clicking on links and watching videos, <laughs> right? So all of these things sort of happen together. It's just it's a confluence of factors that seem to... and. Apple's iOS changes. All of these things seem to be buffeting this industry right around the same time. And they landed up with a heavy cost structure. So I think that's a, at a high, high level, that's what happened with Snap. Yeah, it certainly is a, a company that's exposed to a lot of that that's going on in the digital advertising industry. Like you said, it's brand advertising. You know, this is cons consumer discretionary spend is down. Companies might be pulling the plug. Snap doesn't have control over that stuff. But let's look a little bit also at the business itself. Because you mentioned, you know, they might be laying off between 10 and 20 percent of the workforce, right? They said that they cut their full year guidance. They want to focus on profitability rather than growth for this year going forward. And some things that you pointed out in your article in your that I wanted to call attention to is they, they said they want to focus on three things, community growth, revenue growth and augmented reality. Those are the things they wanted to focus on, but they're going to be backing off of some things as well. They're going to be discontinuing Snap Originals, which is their content creation. Um, Pixie, which is a flying camera project they had, the minis and games, and then also, um, I believe it's Zinli and Voicey, which is the uh, sharing locations on a map. So is, is Snap uh, a victim of the digital ad, ad industry's woes, or is there some self-inflicted pain with this <laughs> specific company that maybe everyone else isn't going through? That, that's so true. I mean, yes, there's, a, you, you know, I would say that the self-inflicted pain is there in a lot of these growth companies, right? Because when cost of capital is low and, you know, growth is abundant, <laughs> like you just need to do a little happy dance and you can get some growth. Uh, then I think people make decisions that aren't really uh, long-term focus, right? So the classic one I think is like AR is an area that has huge potential, right? But it is probably AR, VR is in, in to be mass market is probably what, maybe five years away. At least we haven't seen a mass market product yet, right? So, you know, for a company of snap size to spend money on projects like that seems like, well, you know, it's much better to be a fast follower, right? Watch what Apple is going to do, maybe come up with something after that and you get a piece of the pie kind of thing. Instead of trying to sort of push the boundary there, um, instead of focusing on a core. So that sort of is, is very obvious. Like a lot of money has been spent throwing sort of darts at this long-term vision. And um, the other one that you pointed out, right? You know, like for example, these apps, right? So some of them, one of those apps basically is very similar to Snap Maps, right? So I forgot the name of them. And the other app was sort of regarded as the TikTok of, uh, you know, music, making video tracks and audio tracks and things like that. So sort of like a TikTok-ish app. Now I can understand why someone wants to go and have them because, well, you know, others have it. Everybody wants to do something that's like TikTok, so we should also do something like that. That's the sort of rationale. And it's, it, as management teams, it's really hard because you might say, well, you know, should we do it? You know, you, you're damned if you do it and you're damned if you don't do it, because if you don't do it, people will say you didn't try, right? You, you know, you saw a clear trend towards, you know, the short form videos, uh, but you didn't try anything to capture on that. So. So I think there's there's that aspect, but I think 
for a company of their size, they respect to thin. I think that's the conclusion that you were yeah. probably drawing to. And I think I agree with that. I think that that just makes sense. They're just strong, you know, spread to thin. It, it is interesting, Nirvan. You know, it's almost the tone has changed. To the point you just made, uh, you were um, – the market was very against you not putting your foot on the growth accelerator and taking chances in new, uh, new areas or new growth initiatives three years ago. When money was free, you know, it was kind of go for the growth. And Snap is not the first company to say, we are going to prioritize free cash flow and profits over growth. Now, the market wants to hear the CEO saying that rather than just saying, okay, we're going to go out and we're going to burn our cash on stuff that's not going to work. Sorry, guys. Uh, there were a couple other specific things to the company that I did want to bring up. If anyone has questions, please add them to the chat and we'll ask those as well. But something else you, you brought up in your um, write-up was they paid out $1.2 billion in, in stock-based compensation during these last 12 months. So even though that's not a cash charge, uh, that still dilutes shareholder. Do you have thoughts on that? It seems like a, kind of an egregious amount. Of it. it is. So one of the things that, you know, so the, in, in the SEC filing, we we'll announced the and I said, they're, they're very transparent as a company, which I really like. Like, I mean, they put out uh, a SEC filing that included the letter that, uh, you know, uh, Ivan wrote to the employees. That's really cool to see that, you know, how are they communicating all of these, you know, and then they sort of explain the rationale behind their uh, uh, their choices. So, and but one of the charts, and they included a new presentation, updated presentation, saying that year-over-year year growth until that August period was like 8%, just pretty low for uh, for a smallish you know growth company um one of the things that they, they pointed out then is that look you know if you think about our trajectory we are sort of you know bid up positive or you know our 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 operating leverage is in improving over time and then they had this you know um this chart this graph which pointed to what they were just before ipo and where they were now in a trailing 12 month basis. But the big difference between those two numbers really is, as you said, the stock based comp, which was only 32 million when they were private <laughs> or, or before going public. And, and then that became 1.2 billion. And so that's like- That's a lot more part. now. 1.2 million versus 32 million, big jump, right? <laughs> big jump. So of course it looks like on a, on a, on a cash basis and an operating basis uh, that yes, you are generating more money. And this is something, again, I think a lot of growth company folks don't think about. Like, um, and I'm talking not about investment, but I'm talking more about management. They sort of think that revenue is the number that we need to focus on, whereas if, if the revenue growth really requires that much investment and that investment is never actually going to you know, dry off, then you've got a problem because you're creating dilution along the way. Uh, so they have now they figured out the dilution is a problem. So what uh, what they're trying to do is now reduce the dilution. <laughs> so so they're buying back some shares now. Uh, you know, ironically, given the the stock has completely taken like a fall, a free fall, maybe the buyback is actually so. It, it the way that it was worded, it looked like they spent five hundred million dollars on buying back shares. Um, and they said that the $500 million more than offset all the dilution that they had over the last trading 12 months. Which another way of putting it is that if the, if the SBC comp was $1.1 billion and they could buy back all of that SBC for $500 million or so. Uh, and that makes sense because, you know, some stock might have vested at a higher price, when, but now they're able to buy it at a much lower price. So kind of it's working out for them. Uh, in, in terms of reducing it, but it is just compensating that $500 million is just compensating for the dilution. It's not share buybacks. It's not really creating additional value, so to speak. It's still good, better than nothing. Um, now, of course, if the stock fell another 50% from here, then this buyback in retrospect will not look that great because it could have been greater, uh, in, in the future. So that's the other thing. And, and let's talk about that too. I'm glad you brought it up in your one because. Snap is still right right now trading at twelve dollars a share. This is still a twenty billion dollar market cap. This is not just a micro cap out there anymore. They've got a lot of issues they're trying to figure out right now. Are you interested as an investor, even after the sell off, like you've been talking about? Well, but a couple of things I try to think about. Right. So one is, if, so you try to think of these businesses, okay, from a valuation standpoint, right? And then you could also think about this as an opportunity standpoint. Now. I personally feel that this entire social media arena is too crowded these days, right? I mean, like, and anyone can come from 
the left field and potentially become great, like TikTok, right? But it, it, it always happens at the cost of the existing folks. So the, the challenge here is to really see the future. It's very diff- It's not recurring revenue, right? Brand advertising is not recurring revenue. Um, they were doing $4 billion a quarter at the peak. They might not be doing that much anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? And um, it's very easy to shift those dollars to another you know, popular platform. So, so there's that. So the future is really hard to see here and hard to imagine. That's number one. Then you think about the uh, the valuation, right? I mean, it, it generated two hundred million dollars of free free cash flow at sort of its peak of growth, um, you know, and had a has a had a positive quarter of net income. But otherwise, it's not generating free cash flow. And so, how do I value this business? It's very hard to value this business, and it doesn't have much growth if it's they're saying that the growth is eight percent. So I have a hard time. Then I ask, well, okay. $20 billion of valuation for a business that's not growing that quickly, doesn't have free cash flow, and we can't predict the future. That seems pretty, pretty pricey at that end. To that, if I layer another end, like a lot of people think, may think that, you know, that there's going to be consolidation in the space. Like, for example, pin interest has been, uh, you know, speculated as a takeover for a long time. Like, you sometimes we hear Microsoft is interested, somebody's interested, and maybe somebody is interested. But who is going to pay? Like, let's say you have to pay twenty percent, thirty percent premium to acquire this thing, um, and that is like a twenty-five billion dollar acquisition, right? That's not that many companies that can afford twenty-five billion dollars. <laughs> and you've got to ask: Would among the companies that could afford it, are they really going to spend twenty-five billion dollars for non-sticky revenue, uh, three hundred million uh, daily active users, and and the likes, right? So. I don't know. I mean, there could be a lot more downside. If this was a $5 billion company or a $3 billion company, at that, at that scale, it would seem more uh, more attractive, right? But its daily active user base is similar to maybe Twitter um, at scale. Um, so I'm, I'm not really sure. Again, I, I think it just still seems expensive for what they're doing. But that's, you know, that's my qualitative sort of judgment. And that's also, you know, a bit of a back of the envelope valuation judgment. Like you really have to stretch. You have to really stretch to justify the valuation. And I think that's probably true for other corporations too, right? Like you mentioned the acquisition potential from a company like a, a an Alphabet or a Microsoft. But then you look at what Snap is focusing on. They're focusing on community growth, revenue growth, augmented reality. Those aren't things that those companies need that they're lacking. They've already got their own internal projects for things like this. So it does seem like that's off the table of having some white knight ride in and, and buy this. And like you said, even at 18 or $20 billion that we're at today, uh, Snap could, could still have some some further downside to go. And any final thoughts on everybody? I do want to uh, transition and ch- chat about Upstart uh, for our next topic that we'll be chatting about. But any, any kind of final thoughts? We talked about stock-based compensation. We talked about uh, the refocusing of Snap's efforts on profits and some of the things that are going to be discontinued. Anything else that we're missing as we as we wrap this all up with Snapchat? No, so I thought I would just recap by basically saying that, you know, I think as investors, we, it's good to look at sort of a stock-based comp. Think about the stock-based comp relative to growth, right? I mean, if you're getting 60% growth and your stock-based comp is resulting in 2% dilution, that's okay. But if you're doing 10% growth and you're doing 2% dilution, that's not okay. <laughs> so it's very, very important to think about that. And, and I think it's, we should distinguish when we value companies between recurring revenue, uh, sticky recurring revenue versus you know uh, revenue that can basically disappear uh, with the turn of a knob. I think those sort of things are important when we value the business. And I guess the the last thing to think about, you know, cost of capital plays, it, it, it does, has has a weird role, not just in valuation, right? But it plays it in, uh, into investors' minds, it plays into management's mind. And as the cost of capital had basically become negative, maybe during COVID years, um, it it just has created this, uh, this thing of management teams just spending like crazy, right? Um, so I think those are the things that I would, I would try to think about. And maybe I'll just double click on one last, if I can slide in one more question before you transition here, was the point about valuation multiples. You say we should think about recurring revenue differently than we think about things that could be cyclical or lumpy. Are you willing to pay a higher price to sales multiple or price to whatever other fundamental multiple 
for a company that is recurring, you can count on a little bit more than you would for a company that's maybe a little bit more exposed to the macro. Absolutely, because I mean, recurring revenue, because when we're modeling, uh, when we think about valuation and we're going to model out to the far out years, right? I mean, having recurring revenue basically gives you the, uh, the comfort to say that the revenue is going to exist. It's actually really hard in my mind to actually figure out what next year's revenue is going to look like for Snapchat or, or Snap uh, or five years down the lane. I mean, it's really hard. Whereas a company which has, you know, say a dollar-based net expansion happening of say 20, 25%, you know that they're able to upsell and have done that in several quarters in the past of upselling to existing client base and people, you know, do not churn out of their products. So, so I think enterprise software is is much easier to model into the uh, out years than it is for other businesses. And, and yeah, I mean, I think deservingly so they would therefore um, have a higher multiple, right? And of course, the multiple has to, it can't be any higher multiple. It doesn't mean that it has to be a 100 times sales or something like that. But it, it, it is definitely, you know, you, you know, lower risk in your judgment, right? So, you know, lower risk means you, the valuation would tend to go up. Well, fantastic. Thanks very much, Anirban. Uh, once again, Anirban Hanti talking about the difficulties that Snap is facing right now. He did some really great work on our 7investing.com site um, where he looked into their most recent earnings, the kind of the restructuring that Snap is going through right now. And then also, like he mentioned, another piece as well about the broader uh, landscape of digital advertising out there. Uh, so we're going to transition. You know, we're going to give a couple of minutes for anyone who wants to join here. Uh, for anyone who is listening to this podcast on a recorded device or uh, some from some of our podcast partners. We're actually doing this live today, so we're going to give a couple of minutes before we transition into the next one. We'll be chatting about Upstart. What is up with Upstart and the next topic of our podcast conversation here at half past the hour, but we're going to give a couple of minutes just in case anyone wants to join. Uh, and thank you for everyone who joined our live audience. If you're unfamiliar with 7investing, you can see our site at 7investing.com. If you want to watch all of our podcasts, 7investing.com slash podcast, as well as available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify Podcasts.